Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is View from the North, where we look at things in terms of North America. Today, we're going to talk about agriculture in Canada uh, with Dr. Ken Rogers. We'll be right back after this moment. Dr. Ken Rogers, retired businessman uh, who lives in British Columbia, joins us to talk about agriculture in Canada. It's a really interesting thing. I was thinking about, Ken, I was thinking about wine, you know, how wine has moved up uh, from California uh, to the Pacific Northwest, how wine has moved up uh, from France to the UK. And I wondered if wine has moved up to Canada, to the Okanagan. Uh, is that what's happened in Canada too? Well, there's been wine in the Okanagan for quite a while, but importantly, in the in the moving up, there's two main factors. Uh, one, you know, climate change has uh, has contributed, but the main reason that uh, a variety of wines have been grown in no more northern climates has been the technology. You've got research facilities. Um, around the world uh, dealing with agricultural products in general but since wine is uh, is a high value agricultural product uh, you know countries will look at what variety of wine will grow in a more northern climate you know for example in in Europe you always had uh, you know the some of the best red wines like cabernet sauvignon and, and uh, grown in sort of southern France, places like Burgundy, where you had, you know, fantastic um, white wines in the Rhine country in Germany, where it was far colder climate. You know, well, that same idea in, in you know, northern places, you, you'd say, uh, how much do you have to play with the German wines before they could grow in uh, in a more northern locations such as uh, you know England uh, probably is uh, <clears throat> similar weather to most of Germany but uh, but uh, probably uh, you know we have uh, other climate factors but the research in agriculture is is quite fantastic uh, I mean that's the future in agriculture is really going to be based on what technology can do rather than um, uh, you know, all the problems with climate change. You know, that you, uh, Canada has a lot of technology. You have some great universities. I'm, I'm thinking of McGill comes off that my brain. Um, and it must be given the fact that uh, Canada has such great resources for agriculture, we can talk about how that breaks down. Uh, there must be plenty of technology going on, you know, in the, um, the experimental area through all of the provinces. And in the universities, yes and no. Uh, you know, one of the main things in Canadian agriculture is um, we have a lot of land and not very many people. Well, when you have lots of land and not many people, you can grow something like uh, wheat or flax or barley or rye or oats. You know, grain products. Um, where if you were taking, you know, New Jersey, it'd be kind of hard to have a wheat farm in New Jersey. Uh, you know, where, uh, you know, if you take, uh, you know, my example of the complete contrast with Canada would be the Netherlands. You know, the Netherlands is uh, has the second greatest agricultural exports in the world. Uh, you know, and it and it's really just a little bit bigger than the state of Maryland. You know, it, it's like take New Jersey and double the population, you know, and double the size, and and that you'd have Holland or the Netherlands, you know, and and they produce a fantastic amount of agriculture. Like fifty percent of the land in the Netherlands is is uh, used to produce agricultural products. Um, <clears throat> and that's not a coincidence. Now, they worked hard at it. Well, yeah, but they also have a, a major difference from Canada. I mean, in the Netherlands, you've got a fantastic development of 
of greenhouses and then carry that a step further and you start to get hydroponics or equivalent in inside the greenhouses you know and then eventually you'll evolve to where you got vertical agriculture where you know you you're dealing with artificial light well you know the you know the future of the world for food is never going to be a problem can we produce enough food it's really you know can uh, most of the world afford any you know, yeah, that's, you know, I, I have a Calabash uh, son um, in um, Singapore who's working on vertical farming, uh, which has great prospect over there. But, you know, and very little of it in the U.S. I think there's a, a particular uh, plant in Pennsylvania, but it's nothing compared to other more advanced vertical farming areas in the world. And what, what troubles me about the, all of that is that if you have a lot of land, you're kind of spoiled. I mean, it would be hard, for example, for Canada to move over to vertical farming because it has so much natural farmland. Why would it well, do that? Why would it make the investment? Well, it's not it's not so much the farmland as as the population. You know, for example, uh, there's only only a couple parts of Canada that could justify even a bunch of uh, of um, you know, substantial greenhouses. You know, like you can have a, a greenhouse that um, can use hydroponics or even without that to develop uh, or grow tomatoes and cucumbers and, and peppers. Those are the first three that seem to be, you know, most easily done in a greenhouse. Well, you could have a, a, um, a greenhouse you know, somewhere near the city that I live in, uh, but the market's so small that, you know, you have trouble justifying it. So if you took all of Canada, you know, you really have um, uh, a substantial uh, ability to have something in Southern Ontario, you know, just, you know, let's say not far from Cleveland or Buffalo or Detroit, you know, they're, uh, about um, uh, forty percent of Canada's population is is you know between Montreal and Detroit. You know, if you were to pick a geographic item, well, you got another pocket of uh, of reasonable density right near Vancouver. You know, the what's called the Fraser Valley, but you know you couldn't have any high tech agriculture. Uh, involving greenhouses and and hydroponics in in a place like Saskatchewan or Manitoba or most of uh, you know most of Canada because there's not enough population to support it. It's not worth doing. I want to talk to you about um, um, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. You know, uh, my research: thirty four percent of all the uh, of the agricultural products of Canada are in grains and. Uh, oil seeds that uh, you mentioned a couple of them uh, and that comes from saskatchewan and manitoba doesn't it you know mid, mid, mid midwest so to speak in canada well, yeah yeah what are called the prairie provinces uh, you know you got to include alberta in that um, okay. but um, you know saskatchewan's in the middle and a higher percentage of of the land in saskatchewan is suitable for things like growing wheat or canola uh, canola is really uh you know, an example of uh, of scientific evolution. You know, you used to have a product called rapeseed, and uh, and it had a lot of problems with, uh, you know, you needed herbicides and pesticides, and you couldn't grow it in, in a climate as far north as Saskatchewan very successfully. Well, Canadian agricultural research, uh, uh, you know, modified Rapeseed developed a product called canola, and and it's just about the largest uh, agricultural export Canada now has. You know the the um, uh, well, it's know, a staple oil. worldwide, isn't it? It's a staple just like wheat. Yeah. Well, you know, there you know, soybean oil is is a bit larger still than than canola oil, but uh, you know. 
certainly they're similar in terms of what you can do, but you can grow the canola in a in a harsher climate than than soybeans. You know, we know um, that uh, Ukraine is the breadbasket <clears throat> of Eastern Europe. In fact, you know, uh, maybe more productive than Russia, which is way bigger. And uh, we know that um, wheat in in um, in Ukraine has been stopped um, by the war there, and there have been real difficulties in getting what wheat there is out, um, you know, by shipping it uh, because Russia has stopped the shipping. Uh, real problem for the world, for Africa, for example, and other developing areas. Uh, and I wondered if, um, you know, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, um, um, British Columbia, was it that you, oh, Alberta rather, uh, whether these places have had a boom in terms of exporting and and whether prices of these staples have gone up because of the shortages in other areas because of the war, the invasion in Ukraine? Well, there's a fair time lag for production. You know, and and those areas of Canada are what are called dry land farming, and that's really what Russia and the Ukraine is, uh, you know, where Nebraska, it, by comparison, you know, you you really can't have just simple dry land farming in Nebraska. You got to have uh, a whole bunch of um, uh, of irrigation. Well, that's a you problem know, and, too, isn't it? Well, water is a major problem, and that's where you know greenhouse growing is is really uh, uh, you know the way of the future. In the meantime, uh, sh without the greenhouses, without the vertical farming uh, through the, those prairie provinces, um, seems to me that you probably have the same water problems that Colorado and Colorado River and, and the whole basin in the western U.S. You probably have the same problems about getting water. I mean, you may have floods in one place and drought in the other place. Uh, and if you run parallel to the U.S., those provinces are probably having trouble. No? Well, not yet, but uh, but it's a you know on the horizon. There's measures being taken to correct it. You know the the simplistics are that uh, that the glaciers that feed a lot of the of uh, the streams that run, let's say those provinces, uh, get all their water from the Rocky Mountains or rainfall. You know, like the Rocky Mountain. Uh, glaciers feed you know the uh, like the Saskatchewan river system is is the biggest river system feeding all of the agricultural land well it's not anywhere the size of of say the Missouri river that has the same kind of starting position you know it starts in the rockies in you know uh, montana and and idaho and wyoming uh you know where that um, water flow is less, but they, you know, have started to take measures to preserve it. Like the U.S., uh, many, many years ago, the, the big political thing was to have these mega-sized water projects. Well, you, do, you haven't done any for, you know, I don't know whether it's 50 years or more. You know that there are no main water projects that that the U.S. federal government has endorsed uh, to to really solve a problem like the uh, Central Valley in California. I mean, it'd be a shame to just have it die because of lack of water. Mm -hmm. Well, they say it is dying. Uh, there's plenty of footage on TV. You can see it dying. At the same time, the floods. Somebody said one well, wanted to make a pipe, big pipe. Goes from the flooded area to the agricultural area. What do you think? Well, you know, you can't. The flooded area um, <clears throat> is temporary. You know, if you're going to build a pipe and have a decent project, you might as well start near Portland, Oregon. You know, where you've got the Columbia River is probably the second largest amount of fresh water flowing into the ocean in the United States. I mean. The Mississippi would be larger, but not a heck of a lot, or certainly 
the, you know, the Columbia River be a great source of fresh water for, for California without disrupting anything upstream. Yeah, you know, he you just took it from the mouth, let mouth let of the Columbia. Something else that troubles me. And uh, my research shows that uh, 24% of the agriculture in Canada is from red meat and livestock. And, um, you know, every time I turn around, I, I hear, you know, talk about uh, vegetarianism, veganism, stay away from red meat, bad for climate change, um, you know, it's too expensive, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, of course, the, the, you know, the cattlemen uh, promote the meat, and a lot of other people are opposing the meat. And so there's a controversy over red meat, uh, where it is a very big export. Uh, from Canada, uh, how does that look for the future? I mean, there's there's a a a, a global aversion these days, or potentially a global aversion to red meat. W w what's going to happen to Canada's red meat exports? Well, one thing about exports is you need to put something in perspective. You know, um, red meat and and cal calves and cattle. Exports from Canada are the largest of the agricultural exports, and that they're about five billion a year. But just just to compare that, um, automobile parts are about thirty billion. Mm. You know, the, the you know that that agriculture in dollars is pretty tiny compared to most parts of a modern society. Um, you know, that, that, you know, farm country is poor country. I mean, why is Nebraska and, and North Dakota and South Dakota, you know, not overly prosperous states? You know, they have tons of agriculture. You know, Iowa at least is, you know, upgraded a bunch of theirs, but Iowa, you know, has more processing stuff. But even if you have, you know, uh, a wonderful level of agriculture, you don't get very rich at it. Well, you know, but you mentioned earlier on that food is going to be a problem going forward. There'll be shortages of food, you know, and the markets in food and food products uh, will will have to adapt to that, uh, not only in North America, but in Latin America and in Europe and Asia. Um, and so um, isn't it a good bet right now? to get into agriculture in the thought that as we go forward, um, there'll be problems. These problems will cause, uh, you know, the need for greater investment. They'll cause the need for higher prices. Uh, and um, uh, food will become more expensive, maybe even more lucrative. What do you think? Well, the opportunities in agriculture, you know, as I spent most of my life as an entrepreneur and and you know, I certainly would not go into the agricultural business as an entrepreneur in those parts of the world that are going to have a problem eating. I mean, would you set up a business in Pakistan or in Ethiopia? You know, I wouldn't. You know, even though they're the places where the people are going to starve. You You're know, talking about geopolitics. You're talking about uh, instability. Well, there's there's no aspect of any of world trade that has more constraints than to deal with food and agricultural products. I mean, Canada, for example, uh, you know, most people would think of Canada as, as pretty open for trade, you know, and has lots of trade and doesn't have too many miserable constraints. Well, you know, we have one aspect of agriculture that really stands out as uh, as an impediment to trade, and that's anything to do with dairy. You know, is is you know, if you want a a gallon of milk in in Canada, it'll cost you about twice what it will right across the border in the United States. Mm. I mean, so you're if not you were, exporting if you, much dairy then. Well, no, no. The the problem is they have a um, uh, a marketing board that controls a hundred percent of milk, eggs, you know, chicken, a bunch of anything to do with dairy products. Really, uh, you know, I threw chicken in there just for something to do. But uh, 
<clears throat> but really, it's a constraint, and and um, you know, the the United States is not you know a friendly place to export to because you know that it doesn't take diddly squat in the U.S. to have. Um, some kind of lobby in Washington that suddenly creates, uh, you know, a, you know, illogical but very effective type of tariff. You know, the, yeah, the best we have very strange things going on in the U.S., like price supports in agriculture. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, you know, recently there's been talk about eggs. I'm not sure I know why, but eggs are hard to find now in the United States. Uh, I don't know about poultry, but eggs are hard to find. Um, and uh, for reasons that are not clear, you can't find eggs sometimes, and, and they're very expensive. Um, as, is, so that's a marketing or a market problem, right? It's an irregularity in the market. Uh, and what I'm asking really is, if we can get by these irregularities in the market, if we can export things around the world, then the concern about Somalia and you know other un not particularly stable governments is overcome by the fact that the market will deliver, maybe likely from Canada and the U.S. Um, That's so. a dream. That's a dream. That'll just never happen in <laughs> our lifetime or the lifetime of our children. You know, it just, um, you know that it, it it's it's like saying, um, you know. How many, well, and certainly for my entire lifetime, there's been a dispute between that the U.S. has always had that uh, softwood lumber exports to the United States. Mm. You know, and I think of that as it's it's almost agriculturally-ish in the yes. sense that it's a pretty raw material yeah. type of thing. And, and, you know, and you've got a problem with the price of housing and the price of lumber, but, but you know, there's still always a huge penalty at the border on on all lumber coming from Canada. You know, and it's really stupid, but that kind of stupidity exists in agriculture more than it does in any other field. It is stupid. And uh, here we have where the, the whole country has a, a housing problem. I can tell you that Hawaii has a housing problem. Uh, and, and part of the solution to the housing problem are uh, construction kits, wood kits, prefabricated houses in, that come in a big kit. You open the kit, you build the house. Real simple. Um, but we have problems in importing those things for one reason or another. Maybe it's federal, maybe it's um, you know competition, lobbying. And in Hawaii, it's the unions. Uh, they, they don't want to make it too easy to build a house. And the result is we don't have the benefit of of all that lumber coming from Canada, and that could help us uh, deal with our housing problems. It's really tragic. Um, but let me move on to something about uh, human resources. You know, I, I noticed in my research that you know you can make a decent living working in agriculture in Canada, uh, as opposed, for example, to the who, who said that? <laughs> I have to send you annotated authorities on it. But that's no, uh, well, you can make I, fifty thousand American working in agriculture in Canada. No, wrong. Oh well, yeah, okay. That 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 may be a a reasonable living at, at a low end, mm -hmm. you know. But if you're a college graduate, you know, what kind of agriculture would you go into, you know? And and you, you know, really you'd need a pretty large scale operation like like the united states um uh when i went to university in new york city i had a professor that had written a book uh you know and it was called the great farm problem you know and and was really the us could produce enough food to feed the whole world you know but you know you, why doesn't that happen? You know, like the big problem in the U.S. is the ability to produce far more than can be consumed. And yet the price of whatever you produce goes up and down. I mean, if the weather's a little better and the corn crop is large, then the price of corn goes down. 
you know, and so the farmer doesn't do too well. You know, the next year, you know, there's a drought and and the price is high, but the farmer has to, you know, you know, mow his whole field down because it's, uh, you know, it's dead from lack of water. Well, it takes um, us back to, to technology. I mean, for example, you can um, you can inspect your field with a drone. Uh, you can figure out how well it's doing. You can uh, take measures uh, to make it do better with uh, certain kinds of chemicals, uh, herbicides, whatnot. Um, and you can you can deal with the weather, at least to some extent, using the technology. Isn't that where it's going? Uh, that's how it can go. And that's how, you know, a uh, farmer in Iowa that... Um, you know, has um, pretty easy access to big populations in, you know, Chicago area, et cetera. Um, that might make sense. But if if you're, you know, um, you know, in central Saskatchewan, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're 500 miles at least from the nearest city of any, of any population. Uh, yeah. You know, and so, so, you know, and you can, your dry land farming, you can get it without all of that other expense. And by the time you get your wheat or whatever it is to market, you know, you're, you're lucky to, you know, make a decent living. Well, let's talk about human resources uh, a little more. And that is, uh, you know, in the U.S., we have people who are undocumented aliens working in the fields. They're not making fifty thousand dollars. They're making peanuts, um, and it's you know it's a, a marginal existence. Um, but in Canada, uh, you also have a labor shortage, and I'm not I'm not sure it's the same kind of labor shortage. I'm not sure you have the undocumented aliens working in the fields. I think you can't find anybody. It's a recruiting problem, and maybe it's so, especially in, <laughs> in COVID. Uh, and, and this is a problem. Maybe this is why it's as much as fifty thousand dollars to work in the fields because can't find anybody to work in the fields. Can you talk well, about that? Well, undocumented um, aliens or whatever, undocumented workers is not really a term that has any meaning in Canada. Uh, you know, you know, because how can you? You can't walk across the border into Canada. You know, and and if you just think of Canada geographically, how'd you ever get there by a boat? You'd need a pretty good boat because you got to cross the whole ocean <laughs> to get there. You know, and and why would you go from from you know uh, you know New Hampshire to Canada or from Montana to Alberta or whatever uh, unless you had you know some you know odd reason because there's no great reason for anybody to come now canada has a foreign workers program and you know where i live in british columbia that's that's very very relevant because uh, they bring in particularly mexicans in you know tons and tons of them every every year uh, to deal with all of the orchards uh, you know like you know we have a fantastic uh, export program for cherries you know you can have a cherry that's picked it at nine in the morning they start to pick it in, in an orchard you know a couple miles from my current lit house and uh and by uh, nine the next morning it's it's in a market in tokyo you know it, it's really you know pretty good it's been picked, they've been sorted, it's been washed, it's been packaged, it's been transported, you know, by vehicle to get to an airport and airport to Japan. And and you got these fantastic fresh cherries, you know, tree picked the same day. Um, <clears throat> now, those, those pickers are nearly all Japanese because a normal Canadian, you know, says, well, gee, uh, uh, you know, that's only going to make me, you know, $20 an hour or $15 an hour. The Mexican's happy to come to Canada, 
and send most of his check home for his family, where the Canadian thinks that that who would want to do that? I mean, we're sitting now where we've got 65% of, of young Canadians are getting college degrees. You know, and, and now if you've got a college degree and you think of agriculture, well, you'd like to work at one of the gigantic research centers like Canada has, has 20 large agricultural research centers like the I just mentioned cherries well there's a one of those 20 um, research centers was about five miles from where I used to used to live in another area of the Cologne area it's called about 20 miles south of Kelowna and that research center you know has gone through different varieties of fruit and what fruit will grow best and and you know to have different varieties so you've got about 20 different varieties of cherries that can grow in in our area um now those cherries are still you know in open land you know we got enough land uh you know even though it's a a valley that's uh got wonderful weather and and uh, good soil and growing conditions uh, you know the population is still sparse enough that you can have these uh, huge open agricultural plots um you know much of the world can't do that yeah well much of the world needs canada it seems to me that you know the four corners of this conversation is that um you know you're uh, you're growing grains and uh, what oil seeds you're growing red meats and livestock you're growing dairy uh uh, you're doing horticulture, by my reading, uh, substantially, and you have poultry and eggs. Uh, what do I need to go outside of Canada? I got it all right there. Why should Canada have to import anything? Does Canada import anything? Or is it self-sufficient and beyond self-sufficient? Is it a you know, food breadbasket for the world? And, and will that increase? Well, Canada exports about 50 percent of what it uh, produces an agricultural product however and the biggest market for that's the united states now the united states um has a um <clears throat> let me think it's a i saw the statistics the other day uh uh the u.s has 196 billion dollars of agricultural exports but it has 194 billion of agricultural import you know so it, it really only has a surplus about two and a half billion in agricultural exports mm. now the u.s is the largest exporter of agricultural products in the world uh surprisingly the netherlands is second you know, wow. just comparing the size of it yeah. and sort of, and, and that points the future. Well, the United States, if there was a market, the United States could provide the food or the agricultural product to satisfy that market. It's, it's just, you know, Ethiopia isn't going to buy more U.S. agricultural products because they can't afford it and just that simple you know yeah. there's you know what like india and china are humongous producers of agricultural products you know but you know as a generalization they they're not able to produce enough you know like they definitely that's a problem for them that and you know they're the ones that are got to have to learn from uh you know from places like the netherlands uh you know how do you uh, produce more you know a greenhouse with hydroponics will have probably 20 times the food output uh per you know oh well, let's call it acre you know for every acre of land in a greenhouse that's got you know hydroponics and and artificial lighting well in india you know they they got all kinds of parts of india where they can't even afford heat let alone to have you know led lighting in a greenhouse 
Yeah, and these vertical spaces, the vertical farming areas that uh, don't use as much water, it's more efficient uh, with the hydroponics, isn't it? Oh, far more efficient and far more productive, but still, when you count the the physical structure, like the building, and then the artificial lighting, and if you're doing it like they're doing it in, you know, parts of Canada, parts of the U.S., uh, you know, for example, there's a fantastic facility about, uh, you know, uh, you know, an hour drive from from Atlanta, you know, that produces, uh, you know, just the most high tech kind of greenhouse hydroponics you could get, you know, but, you know, there's none of those in Pakistan or <laughs> either maybe somewhere in India, but I doubt it. Um, you know, and and so the areas of the world that need the food um, really are, you know, suffering. I mean, the oldest type of, you know, let's call it advanced agriculture in a lot of ways was dealing with uh, the ocean. You know, like like, you know, um, most of the seafood in the world is coming from from fish farming rather than from you know open fishing. And, you know, and you got seaweeds and that type of thing that, uh, you know, a big business and could be much larger. Well, you'd say, well, gee, what's the United States doing about that? No, not much, because who needs it? Right. So uh, my last question to you is um, a look into the future. I know it's hard with so many variables to um, get a perspective into the future. But here, you know, we we talked about the what do you want to call it, the irregularities in the in the global marketplace. We've talked about water problems. We've talked about labor problems. we talked about diet changes around the world. Uh, we talked about technology and how it changes things. Um, all these variables all in play. But you know, it seems to me that Canada has great prospect, assuming we can deal with these some of these challenges and um, take advantage of some of the variables. Great prospect in terms of being a, a great source of food in all continents, um, even continents that are capable of growing at least some of their some of their needs. Do you see Canada going that direction? Uh, where is Canada going? That's my question. Well, I do not see a major growth in Canada's um, provision of food for the rest of the world. You know, that, that uh, um, if you used wheat as an example, wheat is often thought of as, as the, um, the queen or the king of all green products. Well, you know, where else in Canada would somebody start a new wheat farm? And how can you produce more wheat from the same acreage? Like there is no more acreage that you could, you know, you know, convert into uh, uh, farmland for growing wheat. I suppose you could mow down some some forests, but uh, but you know, <laughs> the forests worth more than the wheat. So um, <clears throat> I don't see any growth in in um in those simple products like i call the simple ones where you're just growing in a field you're growing something you know you have canada will probably be importing less vegetables and less fruit in the future than it than it is now you know and that will be because there will be some you know um Near Vancouver, you'll have very large uh, um, <clears throat> greenhouses, and those will gradually improve in their stuff, and they will produce the food that will be sent to Alberta and Saskatchewan, you know, by truck rather than it coming from California. Um, however, uh, you know, things like um, uh, you know, meat production, I don't, you know, that that's one Canada could increase quite dramatically, uh, but the U.S. could increase its 
significantly as well, doing it with exactly the same technology. You know, you 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 touch on a point. Uh, we were out of time, but you touch on a point that we really haven't covered, and that is the variable of transportation. If I give you a give you a side of a cow and I tell you to move it around the world, uh, that costs money, and uh, we don't we don't exactly know how uh, the cost of shipping is going to change in the future. Um, but well, that's the that's the great advantage of greenhouses near big cities. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, and and the aquaculture or dealing with uh, hydroponics in a greenhouse, you know, you've got to, the big expense is the building and the artificial lighting, LED lighting, and it's being offset in part because you have a much, much higher yield, but also the, uh, you know, efficiency in water usage, less herbicides, less pesticides. You know, uh, and shorten transportation. Yeah, the, your market yeah, is across the street. Work. That's where eventually it should work out for India and China. You know, in places like Pakistan. But you know, you got to have some entrepreneur in Pakistan that can amass the money to get the piece of land to build a facility. There it is. It, the the export is not necessarily the food; it's the technology. That's what Absolutely. we have learned. Yeah, Ken Rogers. Dr. Ken Rogers in Kelowna, British Columbia, and discussing with us agriculture in Canada. We'll be back in two weeks with more. We want to educate you about Canada, its prospects, and its relationships with the United States. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.